Well, in many ways, this passage needs no real introduction. Uh, we've been going for uh, about four weeks now through a, several, or through a series of gospel texts that are trying to explicitly tell us why Jesus said He came, why Jesus said He came. There are lots of theological reasons why Jesus came. There are lots of inductive and deductive reasons that you and I can understand why Jesus came, but, but from His own words to his own people, to us even this morning. Why did Jesus come? Here is probably, I think, one of the most um, bombastic and titanic reasons that Jesus says that he came. Uh, He shows in this passage, and this will be my outline this morning, he he shows in this passage that he came to be a redeemer for many. Uh, He shows the, the, the mirror and the true object of who he came for, and he shows that while he came to actually do something, he also came in order to provide an example for those who would follow him. So he came as a redeemer. He came from many, and he came as an example for us. Now, with understanding that Jesus came as a redeemer, there are two aspects of Jesus' declaration from this particular passage saying that he came to serve. So there are two aspects of Jesus' declaration of his service towards other people. The the first declares his unique work. So why did Jesus come? He came to serve. What does it mean that he came to serve? Well, he declares his unique work. When Jesus says that he came to serve, he actually hints at his pre-existence. So whenever we think of Jesus arriving, that was a name given to the Son of God, the very Son of Man, Christ, who was not seen by men before, but certainly was there. Before Christ came to us, he was somewhere else. Before Christ came, he was there ruling and reigning, and he came here to accomplish a God-given mission. He came in our text, and also in other texts, it says that he came to call sinners to repentance in Luke 5. It says in Luke chapter 19 that he came to seek and to save the lost. In John chapter 12, it says that he didn't come to judge the world, but actually to save it from itself. And he came to the world to save sinners. We see Paul reflecting on this in 1 Timothy. So so I want us to explore the claim that Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. If you're new with us, this is going to be me just hovering above this text for a while. Normally we walk through maybe verse by verse or passage by passage, but every now and then we encounter passages that just call us to, to hover over it and look down on it and see everything that's there. And I hope that you'll know that a ransom... From this passage, for many is why Jesus came. Now, the word ransom here, another way that you could translate it or use it would be redemption. These words are used and many times interchangeably throughout the New Testament and even the Old Testament. A ransom is a purchase price paid to obtain the release of a captive. A ransom is the purchase price paid to obtain the release of a captive. Now, in ancient times, long ago, think of Old Testament times, a king might pay a ransom to set free a general or a son who was captured in a battle. A citizen might pay a price to set a slave free. And these concepts, both well-known in ancient Israel and even in the Roman Empire, of which this text would have been written for people around it, uh, this passage, this understanding would have been not only well-known, but this is merely a starting point of a metaphor that points to something far deeper. So it's a concept that you and I would easily understand. Who doesn't know what a ransom means? Who doesn't know what redemption means? You know that something is being paid for so that something can be set free. But it goes even deeper at a mere transaction. The story of Christmas. The reason why Jesus came is because he actually sought to offer himself as the price in order to set men free. Not money. He didn't bring gold or incense or myrrh like he would have had when, when was given to him when he was born but he would have offered himself. I want you to turn to the book of Exodus. Turn all the way to the left, the book of Exodus. It's the second major book in the Bible. The book of Exodus, I want you to go to chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6, just a couple of pages over from the start of the book of Exodus, and go down to verse 6 through 7 of Exodus chapter 6. This is where the act of God is uh, not new in condescending by liberating his people. It's not new in the Old Testament. It wasn't new in how Jesus operated or what he said he was going to do. In the Old Testament, God acted as a redeemer by delivering his people from captivity. So look at Exodus chapter 6, verse 6. It says, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and will bring you out from under the burdens 
of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I'll redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Psalm 130, you don't have to turn there. Maybe you could turn back to the book of Matthew. But Psalm 130 also builds off this where it says, where the Lord says that he will redeem Israel from all of not only their slavery, but it uses the word their sins or their blindness, their act of rebelling against God. The psalmist says that he will deliver people from that action, from that desire, from that outfit of their own heart. Now, in our passage's context, Matthew actually announces The very ransom that these two things are alluding to with a question, how can man give an exchange for his own soul? Matthew's done that in Matthew chapter 16. You might look at the price that someone would be worth to be redeemed from their sin. How much is one man worth? And the answer is given later on that a man can actually give nothing for himself. The theological understanding of this is that you do not have enough in you or outside of you to redeem you for the consequences of your sins. So the very mere forgiveness that Jeremy prayed for on our behalf earlier, the very mere assurance that we have in the forgiveness of our sins, none of those things came from us. And this passage is bringing our attention to that. The answer is a man cannot give anything for himself. But I want you to look at what Jesus promises in our text. Look at verse 28. Zoom in at verse 28. Here, the God-man, speaking to people around him, promises that he will give his life as a ransom. And that's what he does on the cross. So while this is Christmas morning, there are other Christian celebrations that you might bring your attention to, but what he is aiming to do in coming incarnate on Christmas Day is ultimately going to a cross to pay the price for you and I to be redeemed. Jesus did not do this with money or with gold or with silver, and the Bible never hints that God pays anyone anything for any reason, nor man, nor fallen angel. God never pays anyone for anything, mostly because everything is owned by God. Why would you pay for something that you already own, right? Many comics are made out of that by actually being snookered into something. And and Peter says that it wasn't even perishable things, such as gold or silver, that you were redeemed. But Peter gives us an, an answer, as if we didn't have it clearly in our scriptures. Peter says that it is by the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, that was paid for man to be redeemed from his sins. Peter says, it was not with perishable things, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Now, the person of Peter, if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, the person of Peter, he was known as an apostle, meaning God used him in such a way to expand his kingdom on earth. He was a friend of Jesus. And there were others throughout the New Testament who were in the same position as this person, Peter, and they all used the word ransom. And they all used the word ransom in God drawing people to himself through an understanding of what this ransom looks like. It looks like what is known as a substitutionary atonement. So a price was paid, meaning atonement, for the forgiveness of sins. But that that price wasn't paid merely as you might take a $100 bill out of your wallet, a $20 bill out of my wallet, and actually pay, I know, I know, (laughs) a $20 bill out of your wallet and pay for something, but rather the atonement that God provided for man was one of substitution. You see this elsewhere being talked about where in our place, Jesus actually stood condemned for our behalf. Or in Romans chapter 3, Paul links the the understanding of justification by faith and redemption together, where your understanding of how you are loved by God is because of the very mere act of his ransoming, ransoming you to himself. Through the work of Christ, God granted to internally godless, unrighteous people an external alien righteousness. Maybe one of the easiest ways that we can understand the gospel is that inside of you is the issue and nothing inside of you can save you. Only something outside of you can actually invade or intrude in your very heart and rescue you from yourself. And how that's done is the very person of Jesus invades the earth, invades your life, sends in his spirit to actually resurrect your life. And all of that is possible because he paid the price for your very heart. So Jesus coming to make a ransom for sinners is a feature 
of the work of Christ, which he offered himself as a blood sacrifice. So when you think of the word ransom, uh, you think of the word substitutionary atonement. But wait, there's even more to understand within this first part. There's more ransom uh, to... uh, Ransom is not just a synonym for atonement, or it's not just a synonym for sacrifice. The term actually produces specific acts of Jesus' work. So the way I want you to understand this is, let's, let's imagine that you have a telescope. Maybe you were a gifted one. What does a telescope do? A telescope allows you to see things very far away, very close up, right? It's an object that allows you to zoom in on things that are far away. All right, so let's think of the word ransom, Christ coming to make a ransom for many. That, that's an object there of him saving himself. But I want you to look at the intricacies of that word ransom in the same way that you might look at the intricacies of uh, your, your eyesight through that telescope. You know, Saturn has rings, or maybe there are people on Mars. We don't know, you know, but you need a telescope to find that out. So use, use, use the word ransom like a telescope, and I think there are three things that the word ransom shows us about Christ's work himself. The first one is the word slavery, so you might even write that down. What ransom allows us to understand is what is the, what is the mere act of slavery being set free. Humans, in being slaves to sin, cannot free themselves. So a deep understanding of ransom allows us to have a deep understanding of us not being able to free ourselves. We cannot unlock ourselves. We cannot release ourselves from our mess. This is not like one of those magic shows that you would go to when someone can break out of a straitjacket or actually undo the handcuffs. Our sin actually binds us more and more deeply. It's like every time we sin, we actually put on more handcuffs on ourselves. We can't get ourselves out. Our only hope is an outside intrusion or a key if it were handcuffs or help if it were a straitjacket. Jesus alone, it says in our scriptures, can release us from sin and its power and its consequences, which include our guilt, our condemnation, and both physical and eternal death. The only contribution that we make to our salvation is the very sin that makes our salvation necessary. So by understanding ransom, keep, keep kind of turning that wheel, and it's like, okay, that helps me understand what slavery means to, means to our sin. The second thing that I help ransom helps us understand is the very word price. Ransom's price is not monetary, though it is very real. Uh, We often speak of great sacrifices with monetary metaphors, saying that those people surely paid a price, maybe to get into medical school, or they paid a price to start a business, or they paid a price to grow their family. But the price that Jesus paid is even far greater than you and I could ever imagine. It's with his own precious blood. God himself, in the person of Christ, coming and having himself be sacrificed for, for you, for your sin, that is a price that you, can, you and I cannot calculate. Now the third word that I want us to understand here when we, when we zoom in on what ransom means is the word Lord. So think of, think of the word slavery, think of the word price, but also Lord. In being ransomed, the slave has a new master. Acts The book of Acts says that Jesus obtained or acquired us. 1 Corinthians says that we were bought with a price. And by paying his own blood, the Lord liberates us, yes, from sin and its power, but actually brings us to himself in his perfect lordship. He frees us, making us heirs to a new life that he provides. And as the metaphor suggests, we are not absolutely free, but we belong to the Lord who purchased us, not only to liberate us from a harmful master, which is sin and Satan, but to place us in the very household, gaining nobility, even through service of a glorious king who would do something that we did not deserve for ourselves. This is the mightiest truth in the Bible, friends, the reality that that God in Christ came to make a ransom for many. Our Lord Our Lord Jesus did not die merely a martyr's death or as a splendid example of self-sacrifice and self-denial. He was not just an example, but those who can see no more than that in his death fall infinitely short of this truth. They lose sight of the very foundation of Christianity and miss the whole comfort of the gospel. 
Christ died as a sacrifice for man's sin, and he died to make reconciliation for man's iniquity, and he died to purge our sins by the offering of himself. He died to redeem us from the curse which we all deserved and to make satisfaction to the justice of God. There's a story of a man in colonial America who went to an auction where slaves were being auctioned off so they could be used on people's different plantations and farms. And he went up to the table and he looked at one man in particular and he said, how much would that man cost? And the person gave him a tally and it was really expensive and it was kind of basically what all the guy had. And he's got an operation going on, so maybe there's revenue coming in, but this is an absurd amount for this particular person to be set free. And he said, okay, I'll pay that. Now, how much would it be for this person to be set free completely? So I want to own him, but then I want to set him free from the bondage of slavery. So the man gave him a price that just seemed astronomical for what you and I would pay for anything today. And the man paid it in an instant. He not only paid for the slave to himself, but then he paid the unconscionable thing would be to set that slave free. And he just walked away. And so the now freed slave went up to the table. You can imagine his world being turned upside down. Like, I thought I was going to go to someone's house, and now I don't even know where I'm going to go. So he went up to the table, and he said, what happened? And the man explained what this other man had done. And he said, what's that man's name? He told him the name. Where does that man live? And he told him where he lives. And then he went off on his way to go to that man's house. And everyone was like, what is wrong with you? That man has slaves in his own home. And he looked at everyone who asked, and he says, anyone who would do that for me, I will gladly entrust myself to him in his tenderness, in his mercy, and his kindness. Friends, we often see that Christ on the cross set us free from the captivity of sin and know that he did, but also remember what he draws us into, his loving grace, his loving kingdom, one that knows no end, one that is full of his glory and his might. So friends, understand truly and clearly of who Jesus is according to this text as our Redeemer. But secondly, I want you to see Jesus as the very object of our ransom. Jesus as the object of our ransom. That This text says that Jesus pays a price for many. Now, the many in this case, we see all over the Old Testament and the New Testament, whenever many is being talked about like this, are the very people of God, Other, otherwise used in New Testament letters called the elect, those who God loved for only reasons known to himself before all time. And this use of the term, the many, was common in Jesus' day, but the idea is actually grounded in Isaiah 53. So go back to Isaiah 53. It's kind of, kind of, in, the middle, kind of in the middle of your text, and then a little bit to the right. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. This is my nightmare. I cannot find Isaiah. Here we go. My my tab fell off. Okay, Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse 11, it says, Out of anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. As he described the work of God's suffering servant, the prophet Isaiah, speaking for the Lord, said, my righteous servant will justify many. By how? Well, he will bear their iniquities. Romans says the same thing for us, that by the sin of one man, Adam, Paul pronounces in Romans chapter 5 that many died. So by one man's sin, many died and suffered condemnation. But now, The death of one man, being Jesus, in our text and in our context, he actually brings life and justification to many. Jesus came to give his life in the place of many as a substitute in exchange for many. The the object or the the pursuit, maybe a better word to put it, of Jesus' coming was for many to be redeemed by his own work. Yes, Jesus came to teach. Yes, he came to heal. Yes, he came to reveal the Father, as we saw last night, but above all, he came to deliver us from the grip of sin and Satan. He came to drink. You can, you can see his, his image that he gives us. You, he came to drink the cup that was set on our table, like something was there for us, and he came and consumed it all. He drained the cup of the wrath of God for many. 
Friends, Merry Christmas with this message. This is the gospel for you, that Christ came for a ransom for many. We are all by nature debtors. We owe to our holy maker 10,000 talents, the scriptures say, and we're not able to pay it. We cannot atone for our own transgressions, for we are weak and frail and only adding to our debts every day. But blessed be to God. What we could not do, it was Christ who came into the world to do for us. What we could not pay, he undertook to pay for us. To pay it, he died for us on the cross. Or as Hebrews chapter 9 says, he offered himself to God. He suffered for our sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring to us to God. And we must never forget this. But lastly, Jesus is not only seen as our ransom, he's not only given us an understanding of who he's coming for, but he also serves as our example, as our example. Third and finally, what our text shows us about the ransom for why Jesus came is that Jesus, our Lord, came and intended to be the example for all true Christians. Jesus, in doing this, chose to become an example for all true Christians. The scriptures say that we should serve one another. We see this in verse 28 of the book of Matthew. So turn back to the book of Matthew if you haven't already gone there. The book of Matthew, chapter 20, our text this morning, verse 28, it says that even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Lord Christ has mercifully provided his people with everything necessary for our growth and our sanctification. He's given those who pursue holiness the clearest of instructions, the best of motives, motives, the most encouraging and fulfilling promises. But even more so, God doesn't leave us with an empty backpack in order to pursue holiness. He has supplied us with the most perfect pattern and example even in the life of his very son. In the steps of Jesus' life, he calls us to walk. It's the model after which we must strive to mold our emotions, our words, and our works in this world which choose a different path. Why would Jesus have spoken this way? Why would Jesus have thought this? Why would Jesus have pursued that? We have an example of someone who served to the point of his own death. The atoning work of Christ on our behalf is not only salvific, but it is truly humbling. If you ever wonder what God has called you to do, if you've ever thought, what will my 2023 be like? Or how can I make the most out of the last seven days of 2022? You have an example in your midst of the one who brought you everything. He came to serve. He came to serve slaves. The atoning work of Christ on our behalf is not only salvific, but it's humbling. Not only should we be mesmerized by his grace, but also prodded to live uniquely differently within this new kingdom that he has drawn us into. And what a loud call it is to lay aside every weight and the sin which most easily besets us. What manner of persons ought to be who profess to copy Christ? What poor, unprofitable religion is that which makes a man content with talking an empty profession while his life is unholy and unclean. If your life has been made clean by Christ, then walk in the very footsteps of which he has shown you to go. 1 John chapter 2 says, He who says that he abides in Jesus ought in himself also walk even as he walked. In conclusion, uh, when I was in Alaska in 2008, I heard this unbelievable story, heartbreaking gut-wrenching story. Everyone knows that outside of Anchorage, Anchorage, there are these uh, banks along the sea that, that appear dry during the day, but then swell up with water at night. And everyone knows that even though it's, it's attractive to play there on the sand when the water descends, everyone knows that you shouldn't do that because even though the water dissipates, the sand gets very soft, soft and it actually traps you. There was a story of two boys who were walking down the banks of the sand just one mile outside of the city of Anchorage, when one of them started to get trapped. And then when trying to help out the other, the second one started to get trapped. And they both started sinking. Now, thankfully, they had a cell phone where they could call for help. And and pretty soon, help was on the way, though they kept sinking, to the point where they both thought that they were both going to die. Over time, a helicopter showed up, and they only found one arm sticking out of the sand where the rescue 
uh, where the rescue person was able to drop down and actually draw up one of the brothers. And he screamed at him. You can imagine the helicopter noise and the wind that is going nuts from all from the propellers. And he called out to him, where's your brother? And the guy called with any energy he could. He's gone. He said, no, where's your brother? And he said, he's gone. What do you mean? Where's your brother? He's gone. How do you know that? Because he made me stand on the shoulders. Friends, let us not leave these verses without asking ourselves, where is our understanding of Christ being our ransom? A price that was paid for sinners to be brought to a king who promises to love them forever. What is the price of Christ being our ransom? What is our idea of true greatness, our true example? What is the understanding of our true hope, life, eternal All of that depends on the answer that we give to these questions. What does it mean for Jesus to come not to be served, but to serve, and to give himself as a ransom for many? Friends, the story of Christmas is certainly an encouraging one. It's certainly one that ought to mesmerize your children and should never stop mesmerizing you, because in the glory and goodness of God on high, he came incarnate to be a ransom for many. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your work on our behalf. We thank you for what it meant for you to humble yourself, to take flesh to yourself, to live amongst scorn and anguish, to die on a cross in order to be a ransom for many. Oh Lord, we pray that your word would change us, not only in how we worship you, but how we look to go towards others for their worship of you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.